Good afternoon. I'm Charlie Netherton, Head of Client Advisory Services at Marsh, and I'm joined today by Steve Harry, Tim Cracknell, and Jano Bermudez. COVID-19 has forced us to become agile in ways that we will not have experienced before. Executives have had limited data to make quick, often difficult decisions at the same time as forecasting what the size and shape of their company might look like in the future. The seismic changes caused by COVID-19 will radically alter our perception of and appetite for risk. By understanding these changes, organisations can begin on their path to recovery, even now while we're still in the grip of the crisis. Today's webcast will focus on three areas. First, Steve from our Financial Solutions Group will look at the likely changes to risk appetite as a consequence of COVID-19 and what this means for risk management in general. Then, Tim Cracknell from our Strategic Risk Consulting Practice will look at the implications for business interruption insurance. And finally, Jaina Bermudez, the head of our Cyber Risk Consulting Group will discuss how organisations can better manage risk in an altered cyber threat landscape. Today's session is the third in our series of risk management webcasts and thank you to all of those of you who are joining us today or who have joined us for, um, the, for the first two parts of that series, Managing Employers Liability and Property Risk Profile Changes. Those those webcasts are available on our website for replay if you miss them the first time round. Uh, we've also got our th fourth and final uh, webcast in the risk management series, Maximising Recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. That's on Friday at noon. And next week, uh, we've got a separate webcast on first party claims considerations on the 5th. Please make sure that you visit our events page on marsh.com slash UK to register for our upcoming webcasts and to view the replays. Before we start the discussion, I want to encourage the audience to submit any questions you have through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your computer screen. We'll cover questions towards the end of today's sessions. If we can't get to your question today, someone will get back to you soon with an answer. And um, if, you, if you have any questions, as I said, um, please put them in the, in the panel. We encourage you to engage with it, make the session as interactive as possible. Uh, and I will then, um, I'll, I'll then invite all of our panelists to come back at the end to answer those questions. Right now, though, I'm going to hand over Steve, to Steve Harry, who will kick off today's sessions on changes to risk appetite. Steve, over to you. Thank you, Charlie, uh, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the changes that we see uh, coming in uh, insurable risk appetite. My area at Marsh is uh, analytics and program design, um, and we run projects for clients looking at modeling their risks, and importantly, we conduct interviews with executives of clients on their insurable risk appetite, have done for many years. So we've got a good feel, we think, for the temperature of this, and also um, how we think it might change. Risk appetite is a really important area for program design for us. Um, it often overrides any analytical considerations. And one thing we won't normally try and do is to build an insurance program for clients that exceeds their risk appetite. Just a quick definition of what we mean by risk appetite here. This is how an organization feels about insurance risk. So it's their willingness to assume insurance risk as opposed to tolerance which is a more scientific kind of ability to withstand shocks um, and is more numerical. So appetite can be quite subjective. Some other features of it, um, we notice that um, companies can be extremely risk-taking themselves in their strategy, but very risk-averse when it comes to insurance risk, partly just human nature, partly just the kind of risk insurance covers. Also, companies where insurable risk is closer to their core competence um, tend to have a higher risk appetite. So a good example would be a mining company managing big physical risks. They're often quite confident about insurance risk as well. Um, and linked to that, it, it depends, appetite depends on their confidence in their own risk management of a particular subject. And of course, it depends on externalities. What else is going on? And this is where COVID comes in. On the slide here, you can see we've represented a little insurance program design dashboard, with some of the dials that we would normally look at to design programs. For a while, these indicators have been relatively stable for most organizations or trending in one particular direction, 
um, and been, it's been relatively easy to sort of have a think about solving the equation of program design. But now these dials are starting to go a little bit haywire. So looking back to risk appetite, um, we think that there are a number of reasons why this might fall. Firstly, as I said, the externality. Um, in times of risk, a good, another good example, apart from pandemics, is energy companies when the oil price is particularly low. They can't afford a shop somewhere else. So externalities are going to push appetite for fortuitous insurance risk down. Of course, if you're retaining risk, you have to pay for this with your own capital. That's been cheap and abundant for a lot of people for, an, for, for a long time. Maybe not so much now. Um, the cost of own capital is very likely to increase. And on the time horizon point, if you're taking on a big risk, your risk appetite and your insurance program, it's sometimes easier to take that risk if you know you've got a bit of time to smooth out the potential volatility of taking increased exposure. Um, many companies now looking at a short term time horizon, need for cash, need for liquidity. So that luxury is lost to them. And of course, the fourth argument there, what we're seeing is that decreased appetite may run into a crunch um, where you also have a need to control external costs um, and a reduced insurance budget just at the time when the insurance market itself is perhaps not really playing ball. So it's important to work out the landscape. And what we think will happen for many companies is there will be this crunch of a reduced risk appetite versus a reduced ability to buy as much insurance as they want. So we may have to retain risk that we don't want to. So what can we do about that? Firstly, it's a good time, we think, for organizations to revisit what their insurable risk appetite actually is and what the trend is. Not always obvious. It might be going down, and we've seen a lot of caution in our client base, but we've also seen a couple of clients say to us, actually, I've always known I could retain this risk. This is my time. Um, I'm going to get a good payback for retaining it now. I'm going to go for it. So it's important to actually find out what is going on. What's happening to the cost of your own internal capital? What sources of capital and liquidity do you have? Is it all drying up? Are you going to have to go to the shareholders next time for anything? Or actually, are things okay? Again, it's important to find out. Um, and the same with the time horizons. And in fact, there's a, an inverse point with the time horizons, of course, in that over the short term, paying your own losses tends to take longer um, than paying out insurance premium. So sometimes um, an increased risk appetite could have that short-term payback just in the fact that you won't have to pay losses um, for a little while. And then, of course, um, analyze the risk portfolio itself. Which risks have you got that are insurable that actually can exceed your risk appetite? It may not always be the ones that you think. It's a mass generalization, but we see people buying too much cheap insurance and probably not enough expensive insurance. Maybe there's obvious reasons for that. Maybe the example is something like PL, which is, can be really cheap, cyber, which can be expensive. And where's risk transfer providing the value in your program? And where is it providing the most value? And where is it providing the least value? And the reason that's really important to know, and models can tell you this, is that if you've got limited risk appetite, you want to deploy it where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. And the models help to tell you this. And of course, are we actually spending our money on the right risks? This is a great chance for people to have a look at their strategy and think, you know what, maybe the pandemic was something we didn't anticipate or see coming. Is something else going to happen? Does this give us a chance to change our strategy? Then we look at the cost of retained risk itself. Um, again, models can help here. Um, we can focus on the management of risk, but we can also look at the actual volatility of those loss experiences. Can we afford to take a bit more volatility here, um, at least in the short term, because we're pretty confident we can start to risk weight where our appetite is deployed. So overall, um, we think the important things here are to get some science behind the process um, and to establish a procedure that will stand the test of time to document what you're doing and to come up with a process that makes sense. This makes sense in normal times, but at a time of um, crisis like this, where all our dials are changing faster and things are moving quicker, we think it makes even more sense to have that science and that agility behind understanding how you deploy what might be a reduced risk appetite. And that's the end of my section.
Charlie. Steve, thanks very much for that. Uh, one question that's come in while you've been talking uh, is this. So clearly for some clients, uh, our, their risk appetite will be falling at the moment. Um, as, this, as the world begins to recover, do you foresee a V-shaped recovery risk appetite in line with that economic recovery? Um, or, or, or do you think it's going to be more nuanced than that? Uh, yeah, the, the question, thank you, Charlie. Um, yeah, the questions are all very um, COVID-themed. Um, um, uh, actually, we would probably say, uh, it's very difficult to say, we probably would see a pretty swift um, rebound in risk appetite, to be honest, um, because the fundamentals were pretty strong in that world uh, amongst well risk managed clients beforehand. What I would say is um, that will probably be deployed across different areas of risk. What we've seen are two things. One is different risks because people are understanding that their um, revenue risk, their business interruption risk is perhaps not as tangible as they thought it was. Um, and secondly, within an insurance program, not always best to deploy your risk appetite at the bottom. There might be other opportunities up a tower or higher up in the program where you get bang for your buck. So maybe V-shaped, but um, with a couple of sort of branches going off into different things. Thank you very much. So Steve, I'm now gonna hand over to Tim, who's going to talk to us a little bit about changes to uh, business interruption. Thank you, Charlie. So we got the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you, Charlie, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, by way of introduction uh, to this segment, um, I'm going to provide a broad commentary on uh, business interruption risk and uh, deal with some of the considerations um, around business interruption, business continuity, and supply chain risk management um, to be borne in mind that uh, I hope you'll find to be helpful. Uh, certainly, uh, COVID-19 has uh, caused businesses to become extremely reactive and versatile, uh, probably in ways that most will have not experienced before. Uh, leadership teams have uh, had to make some very difficult decisions in real time without the usual underpinning intelligence. And um, they've also had to turn their attention, as they are right now, to forecasting as to what the size of the business, the shape of the company might be going forward. So business interruption uh, has suddenly become an extremely hot topic. Um, so I have four areas uh, just to cover off today and then uh, three ideas as takeaways. And as I discuss uh, each of these areas, um, you, you'll see that I'm just raising a whole load of questions and It'll look different businesses will have different reactions uh, to these questions. And I'd leave you just to fill in, uh, in your own minds, uh, your answers to these as I raise them. Uh, so firstly, um, you'll see that I've got the comment on the slide that uh, multinational companies are realigning targets on profit, cash and delivery. Some are suspending dividends. This may resonate with, with some of you. Um, and I've thrown up there some questions around refinancing, uh, restructuring, changes to operational model. Maybe there's an altered risk landscape. So let's just explore uh, those briefly um, in these four panels that are working left to right. And um, in terms of the business model, um, uh, clearly there'll be a question as to whether uh, business activities have changed in the business. And some organizations, as we've heard, have brought on new products to deal with some of the COVID issues, we've heard stories of uh, PPE, mechanical ventilators, hand sanitizer production, and um, these all change the risk profile. So bringing new risks to the organization is important to know whether they're understood, uh, whether they've been reviewed, and whether they're being monitored. Uh, question arises um, in terms of business activities, whether there's been any material changes to the structure of the business, um, it could be that uh, you've been forced um, to close some sites, uh, maybe on a permanent basis. Um, other sites you may have been uh, opened, may have been opened to um, provide some additional resources for you to, to deal with other opportunities in the business. Potentially, the one that sort of jumped out at me really around opportunities is the uh, expansion in e-commerce, how organisations have... Uh, 
switched from uh, more of a from the high street to more of an e-commerce uh, operation, and that expansion uh, has taken a lot of effort to bring on stream. It might be also interesting to note if organisations actually, with the slowdown, have have um, had key stocks flowing into their warehouses um, that would actually aid the restarting process, which will soon come up uh, next few weeks. Um, so the business model changes uh, present business interruption risk profile implications. Uh, let's just uh, run through some of the the financial aspects of this. Um, so uh, normally when I talk to organisations, uh, we talk in terms of a three-year plan going forward. And the question now would be, of course, whether that's changed in line with anticipated training conditions. Uh, one company I recently talked to uh, was talking about a 20% reduction in revenue uh, for this year. Uh, so maybe there'll be um, a dip in 2020. Uh, the question then is, what does your crystal ball say in terms of the uh, 2021, 2022, are they uh, going to be resurgent years? Is there a pent up demand? Um, or are you going to flatten out? Um, there'll be questions actually around pricing going forward, I think. Um, and uh, that, that'll be an interesting discussion point um, as, uh, as that develops. From a trend perspective, um, clearly 2020 may, for some businesses, look very different to 2019. And, um, but it'll be interesting also to understand uh, how that trend might look in the future, whether there is a trajectory that was previously laid out that uh, can be followed or whether that may flatten out a bit. Seasonality, I think, is quite a pertinent point, actually. We see this in the business interruption risk. Uh, some organisations have very seasonal swings and um, it'd be interesting to understand if businesses discover actually that these are taking a different shape for you, whether things get moved, or as we see in some businesses, particularly in like the sports sector, uh, the conference sector, um, travel industry, that uh, some seasons are completely obliterated and uh, ch completely changes the profile. Uh, from a gross profit point of view, um, uh, this is sort of an underlying point in any business interruption insurance program. And uh, typically we're taking uh, the revenue and deducting variable costs in this. But um, I do wonder actually with the experience of COVID-19 whether uh, certain costs have actually moved from uh, being fixed in the business to a much more variable basis. So that'll, that'll actually have an impact on your BI values. So it'll definitely bring them down. Um, interdependency. Uh, briefly, just sort of mention that uh, a concern clearly will relate to vertically integrated companies where there's a progression of production uh, from one site to another and uh, to produce the final products. And uh, any impact um, in uh, any part of that organization can have a knock on effect to the group as a whole. So, the question of whether that risk has changed at all. Uh, just talking about customer base, um, clearly uh, if any of your customers have become insolvent or have uh, disappeared, then that has a, an impact on uh, the operation. And so uh, clearly you'll be looking for uh, replacement customers, see if you can bring them on stream. That'll be a material impact on the operation. Um, contractually, uh, I suggest that... Um, COVID-19 has actually forced us to uh, many organizations to dust off contracts, just actually see what the detail is in them. And so uh, there may well be changes to con the contractual position. Uh, from a competitor landscape, uh, this is an interesting one, particularly if uh, any of your competitors are reacting sort of differently to, to how you are. Uh, some may be struggling, uh, some may uh, become insolvent themselves or, or become financially in financial straits. So, there may actually be an opportunity around uh, competitors, whether mergers and acquisitions opportunities might arise. So those financial aspects have uh, all have business interruption risk profile implications. Uh, let's just briefly look at some of the um, operational aspects. Um, uh, clearly, if there have been changes to the operation, uh, they need to be sort of flagged up, particularly with insurers, um, especially where the e-commerce may have uh, particularly picked up or if you're having brought in new equipment, maybe to deal with the COVID-19 production issues. 
Um, it may be there are some regulatory obligations around there if there are location changes. One of the areas I'm particularly interested in actually is um, business continuity here. Um, to what degree you're actually already in business continuity mode um, and uh, what modifications you uh, might have made to your business continuity program. From a personnel uh, requirement and availability point of view, clearly uh, social distancing is going to uh, have implications on how many staff can be at work and that may have productivity implications. Um, there could be staff illness issues that uh, just give you a question of availability. Um, strategic plans and investment projects uh, are often uh, in the company's mind going forward, but the question now will be whether those, these will be delayed or modified. Um, similarly with maintenance plans, some may be deferred, some brought forward according to uh, what's appropriate for the organisation, but uh, clearly the uh, statutory and regulatory aspects need to be satisfied. Um, looking at production uh, outputs, uh, you know, clearly there will be questions as to whether the volumes will be the same as uh, previously planned. Um, it may actually be that uh, the supply chain is hampering uh, the production volumes that you can achieve. So it would be interesting to understand whether the supply chain is actually flowing or whether it's actually hindering progress. Um, some organisations, just a uh, final point on production, might even consider adding additional shifts just to spread out staff over a, uh, over a longer period. Um, last point on operational risk around uh, the supply base. Um, now, there could well have been uh, findings of shortages or uh, weaknesses in the supply chain. So there's an interesting question as to whether you've been forced to use alternative suppliers, um, whether any supply chain risk management uh, mapping study you may have conducted in the past, uh, whether that's been valuable to you or you feel you need to make a start actually on something of that nature. So um, those operational aspects uh, have business interruption profile implications. Uh, if we just uh, quickly then run through the uh, business interruption insurance coverage adjustments, um, uh, clearly business, the business description may need to be changed if you are uh, conducting any additional activities that aren't currently declared to your insurers. Um, some of you will be uh, have uh, what, we, what we'd call adjustable policies, uh, so where the values do change during the year and we declare the revised values at the end of the year, there are adjustments in terms of the premium, whether if the, if the, if the values do go down dramatically as, as COVID-19 may bring, uh, we could find that a return premium is available to you. Um, the sum insured uh, similarly may come down according to the, the gross profit values. So there could be some changes required there. And that may actually have an implication on the policy limits for those organizations that um, by first loss policies, um, just revisiting the business interruption estimated maximum loss may then drive uh, a change to the policy limit for your business interruption insurance. Uh, I'll put indemnity, period, in, indemnity periods uh, on the slide. Um, one questions whether these do need to move. Um, there was an initial suggestion that COVID-19 may prevent contractors being able to get on site and carry out work. And so that may extend the time it will take to uh, conduct repairs. Intergroup dependency, um, some policies actually have an inner limit and I question whether that has, uh, if that's adequate, um, uh, it's worth looking at that. And then um, last couple of points, suppliers and customers, um, where these are specified on the policy, uh, be good to make sure these are up to date with the correct limits. Um, and inevitably, a, a whole range of extensions can be considered also in that analysis. So um, that gives you a, a bit of an outline on how I see the business interruption risk profile uh, altering under COVID-19. I've just thrown down three ideas uh, to take away. Um, I think it's good for any organisation, if you're not already doing it, to uh, carry a diary of activity over the weeks that... Um, the uh, impact is 
uh, been felt. And just look at your journey, uh, and maybe these points on the slide will help you structure that. Um, for uh, insurers, for Marsh, uh, be good for us to receive some headline business interruption risk profile information, just to identify the changes uh, so that those can be flagged with insurers. And uh, last point is just to say that uh, you'll see in that last column there about business interruption insurance coverage adjustments, um, there may be some things there that uh, need to be changed and it's worth dusting that off, I think, and making sure that uh, that fits the business uh, in a tailored fashion going forward. Uh, so this concludes the segment on business interruption risk uh, profile aspects. I hope it's been of some use and it's spurred some thoughts for action. Thanks very much, Tim. A number of questions have come in while you've been talking on business interruption. I'll just take one of them now, though, which is uh, how well have crisis management um, responses and business continuity plans actually responded to the COVID-19 crisis? Well, that's a very good question. Um, uh, I would simply say that in working in business continuity uh, planning projects, that most of the preparations that organisations consider would not necessarily have taken into account uh, the type of event that COVID-19 has brought to us. Um, uh, its slow onset, um, its prolonged nature uh, has been a major challenge, I think, to a lot of crisis management teams, um, just keeping the communications flowing um, uh, to key stakeholders uh, with no clear end date has been a significant challenge and maintaining morale and um, uh, impetus is uh, a challenge for the crisis management uh, response. From a business continuity point of view, uh, I would simply say that um, we typically look at a range of uh, short and partial interruptions in businesses. And we also look at uh, major damage events with long-term implications. But often we think in the context of uh, what, what are the alternative operations that we can uh, utilise, what can we bring on stream. Uh, but with, uh, with COVID-19 uh, being such a global event, I would say that um, a lot of the alternatives that business continuity normally bring to us have uh, been precluded in terms of, uh, um, let's say, a, in a production setting. Um, Whereas, of course, uh, working from home as we are today, uh, uh, technology uh, has proved to be very robust in many settings for, for office work or for uh, certain services and the activities they take. So I think that um, the uh, business continuity response has been somewhat more challenging, particularly from a, a manufacturing point of view. No, well, thank you, Tim. It's a, not, an, not an easy question, but I think a, a very thorough answer. Um, thank you for, for that. We'll, we'll in, um, invite you back during the Q&A session at the end where we'll pick up some of the other questions that we've uh, had come in. Um, finally, then today, before we move to that Q&A session, I'll invite Jaina Bermudez, who leads up our cyber risk consulting um, practice here at Marsh, to talk to you a little bit about the changes he's seen to the cyber environment. Thanks for that, Charlie. Um, yeah, so uh, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining today. Um, so in terms of threat changes uh, as a consequence of COVID-19, um, they can probably be summarized into two key phases. So um, managing through the crisis, you know, with a focus on uh, productivity for remote workers. So tactical changes being implemented to make sure that um, the network stays up and that users remain uh, able to work. And then secondly, and the longer term um, considerations around uh, a recovery strategy and living with any of the um, tactical changes. So the long term implications of COVID-19 in whatever the new world um, becomes um, as it becomes more apparent. So in terms of uh, managing through the crisis and just uh, my first point is just related to probably the last point that Tim made, which is that most um, business continuity plans uh, are designed for a rapid failover and fail back. Um, whereas what we have with COVID-19 is an extended position in a, um, in a kind of a disaster recovery um, 
uh, response position. So we, we, um, we have an extended position that as a result of that, we've gotten a, a different threat profile. So what we're seeing is then operational changes being made to support end users. Um, and some good examples are um, the um, increased reliance there on the existing VPN systems and the deployment of new cloud systems or um, uh, consumerization, so mobile systems to support end users. So a good example of that is kind of the Zoom conversations we're having where many customers are implementing um, cloud access security brokers, which allow you to connect directly to your Office 365 and cloud environments, but not go into the central VPNs. So that's definitely changing um, the risk profile from a cyber perspective. Um, in terms of uh, how to assess that, um, organizations may wish to uh, look at the risk through the following lens. So Marsh has a very short and sharp assessment that it takes, um, and I'll kind of walk you through some of the key points that we cover just uh, briefly. The first point we look at is um, the security architecture changes or new implementations. So have you implemented new technology to support your remote workers? Or have you changed the existing technology, made changes to your firewalls, uh, made changes to your endpoint security and access management to allow users that would previously be working uh, re entirely from the office to work remotely and the implications of those changes. Um, considering the, um, the endpoint, so mobile devices and bring your own device, and then particularly workstations potentially where um, uh, they were not designed to be uh, accessed and used remotely, but may have to be. So a good example there is um, the support for privilege administrators managing the infrastructure or for um, regulatory controlled um, personnel such as traders who need to be uh, um, continually monitored, but uh, the, the monitoring infrastructure is designed to be um, used from the office exclusively. So the tactical changes um, required to support that, uh, the access management rules and changes. Um, and then we look at vulnerability and vulnerability management. So a good example is the increased reliance uh, for on, on Zoom technology that we're using today, um, you know, and the kind of public conversations around some of the vulnerabilities that exist in that and some tactical changes that are being recommended, um, such as the deployment and kind of more widespread use of passwords to protect Zoom conversations to prevent unwanted um, unwanted attendance at events and, and, and meetings. Um, security monitoring and event monitoring. So considering um, the uh, visibility that you have over the environment. So um, a good example there is the use of cloud access security brokers where um, there have been bandwidth issues in terms of getting your whole workforce to connect via the VPN and then out again um, via the egress points to the internet. That is typically what is um, hamstringing um, uh, organizations that we are talking to. And the, um, the neat solution for that is to implement direct to cloud brokers. The downside of that is that, you know, 80% of your end user traffic may then be going directly to the cloud and your central investment in security tooling and monitoring is obviously then much more um, ineffective. And so where we're seeing clients respond to that is through kind of increased learning and getting their security managers and personnel to come up to speed with the cloud, with the monitoring tools, and, and, and all of that is causing some uh, disruption. Another key point is looking at incident response. So the incident response process and forensic investigation that is required um, to support and respond to incidents that may have regulatory implications, so things like data breaches, that may be reportable within a certain duration to the ICO or the FCA or the Office of Fair Trading or, or good examples, all require fairly lengthy forensic processes. So good examples are recalling entire disk images or mobile device images um, across the network if that capability exists or in person. So uh, thinking about how you respond to those events and making sure that those processes are still effective. And then lastly, but certainly uh, not least, and it's been the subject of a, probably the most conversation around cyber threats and COVID is increased awareness and training. So uh, good examples here are the um, very visible um, COVID related phishing campaigns that have been going on. So supporting your end users with targeted awareness training around that and what communications, uh, official communications will look like. And then secondly, um, just general remote tips um, for uh, for workers kind of working out of the office uh, who potentially haven't been um, haven't been used to doing that 
and actually we have a, a 10 step um, leaflet that we can offer to anyone who is um, who is interested um, post uh, this 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 call so that those are the main implications or considerations for managing through the crisis I think we're kind of halfway through that now and kind of thinking about what the longer term um, considerations are for recovery and um, before I touch on that I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the trends that we saw uh, in running um, uh, a global cyber survey. Uh, we, we, we run it every couple of years uh, in conjunction with Microsoft and we talk to security managers and leaders across a wide range of organizations internationally. And I think there's three interesting stats. Um, we ran it last in 2019 and prior to that 2017. There's three interesting stats that I want to just touch on that have implications for the long-term recovery and threat profile for cyber and um, in COVID-19. The first is that at the end of 2019, confidence in cyber defense was at an all-time low. It was already on the decline. So um, we had, in, so this is a UK specific stat. So we had 36% feeling confident in 2017 down to 31% in 2019. Um, so that's worrying in itself. That is coupled with uh, a, a continued trend to embrace new technology. So despite the decreased uh, confidence in the ability to defend organizations, organizations are still embracing new technology. Um, and, and, and of course, as part of COVID-19, they'll, they'll, they'll see a rapid acceleration of several components of that technology. So consumerization, cloud um, will, will definitely be adopted um, in large scale and much quicker than was intended. And then the last point, which was an interesting point that came out of that survey was the fact that very few organizations adopting this new technology are, are doing <clears throat> full evaluations during adoption. So that was already pretty low. It was, still, it was about 70%, but you know, we'd expect most organizations to want to evaluate the risk. Then secondly, um, it drops down to about 30 to 50%, depending on organizational profile of organizations that reevaluate the risk once the tooling has gone live. And worryingly, it drops down to about 5% in terms of organizations that continually reevaluate tools and technologies that have been implemented over the life cycle, um, the, the, the entire life cycle. So what that tells us from a COVID point of view is that um, new technologies, changes that go into the environment um, are there for the, for the long haul. So with that in mind, and um, considering or considerations for recovery, the first one uh, I have there is, is exactly that, is there's, there tends to be a reluctance uh, to revisit or reverse changes made during the crisis. So once the users are up and running, you know, you lose the opportunity to either implement um, compensating security controls, which is why it's so important to manage through the crisis um, effectively. And lastly, you may have to end up living with um, whatever the compensating controls or the residual risk is um, for much, much longer than you had planned. So that's the first point. The second is with the rapid decentralization of the workforce and supporting tools. You know, we've seen programs that escalated, you know, that, that were months or years away. We've kind of done this in weeks. So that is something that um, security managers will be continuing to grapple with for years to come, we believe. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, you know, the implication or the, the impact on the security, existing security strategy and any funding implications. So um, the example I gave earlier where uh, a cloud broker was implemented for an organization to allow 80% of the traffic to go directly to the cloud may have bypassed key investments in security controls and may require refunding to either retrain security staff or invest in new cloud-based uh, security monitoring tools to maintain visibility. Um, so all of that um, is, is, is changing the risk profile. What we um, would expect organizations to do as, as in response to that is take a step back, um, take a step back and re-baseline the risk register. So focus on new emerging loss areas. So where, where in the new world do we, um, do we stand to lose from cyber, cyber impacts or cyber threats? Consider changes to the program, um, and that includes funding changes. And then as a last point to consider uh, risk transfer or cyber insurance arrangements and consider any changes, whether it is um, 
reliance on existing policies, non-cyber policies um, for cyber cover. So there's an extended, there's a, there's a change in that in any case in terms of this uh, silent cyber. And then secondly, looking at where and how much cover you have uh, for your cyber specific cover. Um, I think that's the end of pause there. Um, I see Charlie's joined us again. Thank you very much, Jano. Um, we've, we've got a, a number of questions in, but I think at this point I will ask um, all of the panelists to rejoin us uh, and we'll move on to the Q&A section of, uh, of today's session. Um, gonna gonna field a few of these, um, first of all. Um, we, we've, had, we've had some questions here around, around specifically on insurance coverage. Um, those, are, those are better directed to your Marsh representative, the, um, the insurance representative who you work with on a regular basis. I'm not going to pose those to, to, this, to this panel who are, um, in the most part, a risk management um, a, a, a set of risk management experts. Um, and I'll, um, uh, but if there's anything that does uh, directly talk to the, particularly on the BI or the cyber response, I'm, I'm happy to pick those questions up. So a couple of questions around uh, around uh, BI, I think, have come in here. Um, first of all, um, there's two here really related. Can social distancing measures be used in a model of the impact on production post COVID lockdown? And at the same time, how do we need to treat the declaration of home working and furloughed individuals in those BI in that BI submission? Tim, that's a question for you. A nice question, thank you. Um, so I think that uh, certainly the focus um, going forward is sort of planning that return to work, uh, business restoration plan development, and uh, restoring value chains uh, within business to to maximum effect. And um, you know one of the things that Marsh are suggesting organisations do is conducting a business impact forecasting for different economic scenarios. And, and the, 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 the question posed there is around um, the, this question of productivity almost. And I would say that uh, this is a, a natural feature of the organization as you, as you plan forward. Uh, certainly if that has impacts on ultimately the financials of the business, uh, that needs to be reflected, I think, in the declarations that are made. Um, in terms of the the furloughing side, you know, ultimately it'll be a question of what the costs are in the business. So as I sort of indicated earlier, there will be questions in terms of uh, how the gross profit is made up going forward. Um, uh, if we took a, a typical example, uh, let's say of a retail organisation that uh, may have gross profit, what we might say something in the order of like 40%. Um, so, um, 60% of uh, revenue would uh, relate to uh, what, what we term cost, uh, variable costs, cost of sales. Um, in the furloughing, it would be interesting to see how that models through in the figures, whether the gross profit figure goes up or down according to the costs going forward in the business. So I think that um, that kind of modelling is important and uh, I would suggest that you may wish as any organisation to run these sort of business Im impact forecasting models for different economic scenarios to uh, then put forward the appropriate declaration for insurers to make sure that if the business does suffer a loss as insured under the policy going forward, that you get the appropriate indemnity uh, from insurers. Thank you, Tim, for that answer. A couple of questions on risk appetite now for Steve. Um, what can we do if we don't actually know how our risk appetite is going to change? And, and given that, how do I prioritize my risk appetite across the program? Thank you. Um, yeah, the first one is particularly pertinent, I'd say, because actually that's probably where a lot of people are at the moment. It's quite early to tell. Um, so um, we, we would say that, again, um, looking at our kind of analogy of dials and looking at how they're going to change, this is where we're doing scenario testing. This is where we're saying, okay, we don't know how it's going to change, but if we know the parameters and we have some kind of modeling that helps us look at the outcomes, we can tweak the parameters. What if our cost of capital doubles? What if the cost of insurer capital doubles? What if our time horizon is, is five years and now it's three years? Um, at least we can start to 
um, test where our pressure points are. So we, we're never going to know, but we, we start to test. Um, and um, in terms of the second point about prioritization, um, one thing that's interesting at the moment we see is, as, as I mentioned briefly, um, it's not always the best area to deploy risk appetite at the bottom of the program. It might be that you're more comfortable with some higher level um, risk retention. Um, so I, I guess um, we would say look at all of those risks and try and analyze your insurable risks because you may find some of them are providing with great value and are absolutely indispensable. And you may find that some perhaps not likely to provide the payback in the foreseeable future or they may be layers in a program which for pricing reasons are very inefficient. Um, so we're doing work with clients to look at the efficiency of their insurance program at all sort of strata and saying if something's inefficient, if it's expensive, um, then you might get a payback for taking that risk yourself. So again, um, I'm an analyst, so I always tend to come with an analytical answer, but there's kind of a little bit of analysis of the program there would help. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, a couple of cyber questions here have come in for Jano. Uh, first one, Jenna, what are the difficulties one should consider in, to ensure that opportunities are not lost as we move back to BAU? And I guess that slightly begs the question, how will we move back to BAU and, and how, to, how to take that into consideration? So, thanks for that, uh, Charlie. So, first of all, the, the, the big question that remains is, is what is the new BAU? So, you know, that's 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 one of the worries that um, that we're grappling with. So, um, there, there may there may be no aggressive move back into uh, the traditional or, or the old model. And one of the things that we commonly see in large cyber crisis when you lose whole swathes of the infrastructure is that when organizations rebuild, they, they choose to rebuild it um, optimally. So they choose to rebuild the 2.0 version of their environments. And so um, there are some pros and cons to that in terms of, first of all, um, there are some opportunities to improve the infrastructure, but secondly, um, usually once that touch has happened in terms of the changes that have been made, um, that is the point at which cyber teams have the most influence. So until the next change comes around, they'll have to live with that change, which is why we're urging customers to focus on the recovery, implement tactical changes, think um, think outside of the box. So, you know, if you can't make uh, or you can't implement your your standard tool set and think about how, for example, you can implement uh, visibility controls using the cloud technology that you're working with um, or um, educating your security teams to um, to make best use of, of, of the new platforms, features and functions. That some, is something that security teams tend to lag on. Uh, thank you, Jane. And talking about training, Tim, is, is a question for you. It doesn't directly relate to, to BI. It's a broader risk management question. Um, um, Marie's asked, uh, do you consider it a necessity for professionals working within key areas of a business, for example, property, insurance, health and safety, building management, etc., for them to have a broad chain, uh, training in risk management? And how far should that training extend across the senior and executive teams as well? Question. Um, yes, uh, I would say that uh, that training, risk management training, is is uh, important. I think uh, across a good broad spectrum of people. Um, one of the things that I've done in, in my history is to sort of undertake the Institute of Risk Management exams, and um, you know that gives you a very good grounding across a broad range of uh, disciplines in the risk world. Um, I think that. Risk, risk management clearly is a, a sort of a key component of any executive role. They need to uh, certainly manage crises within an organisation and be able to deal with some of the risk issues that are reported uh, through to board level. So I think they need to have a good understanding and take a responsibility. But in terms of the detailed uh, understanding of individual facets of uh, risk management, I would say that um, that sort of deeper knowledge would actually sit better uh, with the subject matter experts uh, within the business. Uh, so naturally, uh, if you took health and safety, environmental issues, for example, you would expect them to have uh, very detailed understanding and uh, education in that particular area. Uh, so I think, um, you know, arguably a little bit horses courses, but um, certainly uh, a broad understanding of risk 
and uh, the appropriate training, I think, is appropriate um, at different levels within an organisation. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. So, um, Jano, a couple of cyber questions, just to switch tack here for a, a moment. Um, yep. A two-part question, really. So, what are the main reasons for a cha uh, change in confidence in cyber defence? And then more broadly, uh, what do you think the long-term implications of COVID-19 are on the cyber threat landscape? Thanks for that, uh, Charlie. Yeah, um, so I think the the main reasons in decline, and um, you know, this is based on uh, leadership responses to uh, the cyber questions, I think was um, actually positive, touted as an increased awareness of the cyber threat. So I think the, 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 the positive side is that there was an increased awareness of the immensity of the, of the cyber problem and the fact that businesses are transforming uh, digitally and relying ever more on technology. And so I think that is, that is probably the main reason that's driven the decline. Um, unfortunately, that's been coupled by an increase in acceleration in terms of adoption of that new technology. And uh, in terms of the longer term implications of, of, of COVID, I mean, my view is that we have basically accelerated that digital transformation um, for many organizations from, you know, weeks, months, years into a, a very short condensed time frame. So I think there will be uh, long term exposures by many companies that will uh, eventually um, be exploited by, by very serious threat actors. I think what we're seeing in terms of the cyber threat at the moment is fairly surface, so using you know standard phishing exploits. But I think what you'll see in the longer term is, uh, is, is an analysis and understanding of where organizations have made changes to keep up and then uh, a, a targeted exploitation of those changes through, as an example, targeted malware campaigns or, or similar uh, uh, compromises of IoT and in-home smart devices and things that probably previously weren't real threat vectors, but as we move towards um, this new way of working will become increasingly kind of uh, more prevalent. Jano, uh, thank you very much. That's uh, all the time that we've uh, got today. I'd like to thank Steve, Tim, Jano for participating in today's session. Uh, and also thank you to all of you for, for joining us. Um, some questions uh, also came in about some of our materials. Um, everything that we have is published on our, um, uh, on our um, Managing COVID Risk um, a, a portal on our website um, so please travel there you can also see a replay of today's webcast um, and uh, and uh, sign up to any of our future webcasts as well um, specifically I think the 10 page leaflet that Jano referred to and also our results from the Marsh Microsoft Cyber Risk Survey uh, all, all, um, all available on our all on, available on our website um, if you uh, if you want to join us for any of our um, our future webinars, please sign up on our events page on marsh.com/uk uh, to register for those webcasts and again to see all of those uh, webcast replays. Thank you again for uh, joining us uh, today and stay safe. Thank you.